out to you, Jesus, to allow you to change us, Lord. Bless this message. Bless this church. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, brother. Hey, good morning, church. It's good to be back. Uh, And this is indeed number three in a series of three messages on the family. And I'm grateful to our pastor, my pastor, for the invite to to bring the word these three weeks uh, on the family specifically. Uh, And speaking of on the family, uh, I want to share with you some news from our family. It was 22 years ago uh, this month, 22 years ago, June, Now, this was long before there were iPhones or smartphones. People still took pictures with cameras. And I came out here and I said, hey, I want to show you a picture of our first grandchild. And it was Benaya, who was born in June, uh, 22 years ago. And as I held them up, they all kind of cascaded down in one of those vinyl things and whatnot. Well, Benaya is getting married this next Saturday. It's a wonderful day for our family. And here's a picture of Benaya. And uh, he is on the staff team of the creek. And this is Miss Ava Thompson. And Ava and her family are part of the creek. But this is a hoot. Ready? I want to show you when they met. Here's a picture. When they met, they, here's Benaya, and here's Miss Ava. She's already meeting Benaya in children's choir at Indian Creek Christian Church. Uh, now, right, I want you to know this is a great place to meet your future spouse. Right now in the nursery, parents, I bet there's a little guy crawling over right now because he spotted your daughter there and he wants to go introduce himself. Wonderful things can happen in church. All right? Now, so anyway, family, we love our family. We're so great. I remember when I was 22, I got married to Leah and we were dating and she's a PK, preacher's kid. And uh, it was really difficult to try to get her to want a date, and finally we were out for pizza one night, and I just took her hands in mine, and I was thinking, all right, preacher kid, she knows all the hymns, and I just looked at her and I said, I need thee every hour, <laughs> and she looked at me and she goes, I'd rather have Jesus, <laughs> so, but we made it, all right, we made it, all right, so here we go, uh, not that long ago, we were in New Orleans, and we were with Aaron, Shauna, Everly, and Nora. Nora plays soccer, and she's in middle school, so we were going to one of her games at the city park, and as we're walking in, the stands are already full of parents and grandparents screaming, yelling at their kids, come on, and yelling at the officials, and I walk in, and here on the cyclone fence is this sign. I took a picture of it. This is what the sign said. Reminders from your child. Here's the grip on the fence. Reminder from your child. I'm a kid. It's just a game. My coach is a volunteer. The officials are humans. No college scholarships will be handed out today. And I just thought, wow, appropriate. Nobody on the field is going to make the U.S. Olympic soccer team, all right? So as parents and grandparents today, listen up. This is very important. It's not our kids making the soccer team, it's our kids making Team Jesus. That's where we're going in these three weeks. Third John verse four, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. John the Apostle is writing that to his spiritual children. I have no greater joy in life, no greater fulfillment, no no finer uh, celebration than to hear that my children are still walking in the truth. Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. Everything is secondary to that. The jobs we get, the titles we have, the degrees we earn, the money we make, the trips we take, everything is secondary to our family making it home to Jesus together. Are we on the same page for three weeks? All right. Everything is secondary. Now, GPS Simple thing for my simple mind, I said we're going to do three things for these three weeks. We're not talking about a global positioning system, the array of satellites orbiting planet Earth. We're talking about a divine GPS that would take us to our preferred destination, and that would be home with the Lord. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 8, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. I'm so glad we know the Word of God at the creek. 
We all want to make it home with the Lord, generation after generation. So we have these three elements that when they work together cohesively, there is every greater likelihood that we will indeed reach that desired spiritual preferred destination, home with the Lord. Now, two weeks ago, G, what was the G for? The word grace. When a family is giving the gift of grace, when the family shows mercy one to another, when we are quick to forgive one another in a family, we're going to create a family culture, a family environment where love will abound. We're not keeping score of records of right and wrong. No, we're going to be quick to forgive, show grace. And when that happens, there's every greater likelihood that a family is going to make it home with the Lord. Last week, the letter P is prayer. And we looked at the life of Jesus, and there are six elements from his prayer life, Kodak moments, that speak directly into the militant nature of prayer, the powerful nature of prayer that can move a family along to a place where we make it home to be with the Lord. Now today, Eric already made mention, the letter S is for Scripture. And we're going to get into the Word of God, and we're going to see from the life of a guy named Paul and his adopted son in the faith, Timothy, Paul and Timothy, insights about the importance of Scripture helping us all make it home to be with the Lord. Now, we're going to approach the text this way. When, when, when I looked into the text, I thought, this is perfect. The, the text lays out itself kind of like circles, three circles. And uh, some of you are familiar with this pattern that I've used a few times. Simon Sinek, The Theory of the Golden Circle, uh, TED.com. You just type in Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K, Theory of the Golden Circle. There you will find that he says... Most companies or organizations start from the outside, and they, they can tell you what they do, what services they provide, what they make. Some people can go a step further and tell you how they do what they do, but only a meager handful can tell you their why. And he said, if companies, organizations will start with why and move outward, they will have a greater impact. We're going to start with why, we're going to move to how, and we're going to end with what. Because with all of my heart, I believe the Word of God will have a greater impact if we will have ears with which to hear what the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, says to the church. All right, here we go. We're going to start uh, with why. And we're going to be in this book of Second Timothy. And I want you to turn with me to chapter 4 because we have to Look a little bit at context. Paul is the author. He's writing to young Timothy. He is writing from a Roman prison cell. Paul is on death row. This is his final letter. He's going to put his pen down at the end and not write anything more. Paul knows that his days are numbered. When Timothy gets this letter and recognizes the handwriting of his beloved spiritual father, I just wonder, it's so full of emotion, I wonder if tears just roll down his face with the reality that time was short. In chapter 4, verse 6, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering. What that means is uh, Paul, being Jewish, he's thinking about all the drink offerings at the temple in Jerusalem. If a drink offering was being poured out at the base of the altar, they would shake out every last vestige of whatever that liquid was. So Paul is saying, I'm being poured out. Life is leaving my body. I'm being poured out like a drink offering before my God. And then notice he goes on to say, and the time has come for my departure. He's not telling Timothy, I'm going to be released on parole. No, this is it. My head will be severed from my body. He's a Roman citizen. He will not be crucified. He will be executed by beheading. The time has come for my departure from planet Earth. That My days are numbered here on death row. I have fought the good fight, meaning he has fought the fight against evil, against sin. I fought the good fight. I have finished the race. Here I am at the finish line. 
I'm not at the beginning, at the start of my life. No, I'm at the finish line, and I have kept the faith. Kind of like what John says in Revelation 2, verse 10, when he says, be faithful to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. Paul was not called to be successful. He was called to be faithful. I have kept the faith. And then he goes on, and he says, now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul was ready to go home. And he's writing this passionate letter to his son. And why, why does Scripture play such an enormous role in getting our family to the finish line. It's right here in the letter, chapter 4, verse 13. Or excuse me, chapter 3, verse 14. But as for you, so he's speaking now to his, his son, but as for you, Timothy, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of. See, it's one thing to learn something, and it's another thing to be absolutely convinced of, uh, of something. Kind of like it's one thing to believe, it's another thing to be convicted of that belief. If you remember back, it wasn't that long ago, when there were 21 Coptic Christians, and they were kneeling along the beach on the Mediterranean Sea, and standing behind each and every one of these Christian men, there was an ISIS fighter. And... Uh, they all announced, uh, requested, demanded, urged these captive Christian men to renounce Jesus. If they would renounce Jesus, they would live. But every single one of the men said what? No. And every single one of those 21 Christian men had their heads severed from their bodies. See, it's one thing to believe, it's another thing to be absolutely convinced. And they were convinced of what they had learned, they had come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And they were going home to be with the Lord. They were convinced of that. Paul is saying to Timothy, you've got to go beyond what you have learned to be convinced of, convinced of. And then watch this, because you know those from whom you've learned it, we're going to talk about who those people were, from whom you have learned it. And I love this, and how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, stop right there, how from infancy, the word infancy, brephos in Greek, it means literally newborn. From the time that you were a newborn, from the time that you were crawling, from the time that you were waddling, from the time that you were walking, young Timothy, you were being taught the Word of God. You were being taught the Holy Scriptures, which are, here it is, this is huge, which are able to make you wise for salvation, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. His life had somebody teaching him the Word of God, and that Word of God led him to a place where he could put faith in Christ Jesus and get saved. So this passage right here tells us the why of uh, Scripture being a part of our lives, why it must be a part of every family. It's huge. God wants everybody saved. Paul said to Timothy in his first letter, chapter 2, verse 4, he said that God wants all people saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Similar, uh, Peter said in his last letter, before he dies by crucifixion, God wants no one to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So in your family and mine, God wants every husband, every wife, every son, every daughter, every grandson, every granddaughter, every grandma, every grandpa. God wants everyone saved in our families. And what's going to get them there? The Word of God. Think with me for a moment. General revelation. God reveals himself in a general way, whether we are in the outback of Australia, the jungles of Africa, the polar ice cape of planet Earth. Wherever we are, we can see God revealing himself in a general way, with the sunrise and the sunset, with mountain heights and ocean depths. We hold in our arms a newborn baby, and we go, oh, there must be God. This could not all happen. The tilting of the earth, the changing of the seasons. God must exist. God reveals himself in a general way. 
God reveals himself in a a special way, special revelation. He uh, revealed himself to Moses in the desert in a burning bush. He revealed himself to Paul on a road to Damascus in a blinding light, burning bush, blinding light. God can choose to reveal himself in whatever unique, special way he chooses. But number three, most powerful of all, God reveals himself in his word, word revelation. The the mountain heights, the ocean depths cannot tell you and me how to get saved. We need this book. Our families need this book. Why is it essential for it to be a part of your life and mine, your family and mine? Because it will make us wise to salvation. You know, there's, it's very interesting. If you go to Ohio State University in Columbus, why you'd want to go there, I do not know. However, if you go there, you will see a most unique uh, sidewalk system. So this is the oval, the oval of Ohio uh, State University. And look at all of these sidewalks. That's just incredible. Can you imagine trying to find those sidewalks under six inches of freshly fallen snow? That, that, and, they, and they go in every direction at every angle. Why such a complicated, haphazard-looking set of sidewalks? Here it is. If we go back when the school was being built, when the campus was being developed, these paths are where students walked on dry dirt, in muck and mire after it rained, and the campus leadership, they just decided, well, let's pave where the students walk. Psalm 119, the longest chapter in the Bible, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. The Word of God will dispel all of the darkness of confusion as to our salvation. we got to have it. It's got to be in your life and mine, our families. Here's the how. Let's move to how. How does that get done? Think, reach, and teach. Every one of us must reach for the next generation and teach them This living, enduring, unchanging word of God that makes us wise to salvation. Now, what does that look like in Paul and Timothy's life? Simple. Chapter 1 of this last will and testament of Paul. Notice with me, chapter 1, 2 Timothy. It says here in verse 5, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, in Grandma Lois, and in your mother Eunice, in Mom, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Do you see the transmission generationally of salvation? Grandma Lois got saved. She led her daughter Eunice to Jesus. They led Timothy as a boy, teaching him from infancy when he's crawling, waddling, walking, the Word of God that is able to make him wise to salvation. It had to happen in the Word of God, in this teaching moment, in this teaching moment. Now, where where was dad? We don't see anything here about dad, his biological father. Well, let's put a marker because we're going to come back to 2 Timothy, and let's go to the book of Acts. Now, remember, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. Acts was written by Dr. Luke, a physician. He fills it with all kinds of detail. Doctors like details. In chapter 16, Paul meets up with Timothy for the very first time. Their paths cross. This is where they meet up, and and Timothy is going to become a protege of Paul. Notice in verse 1, he, Paul, came to Derbe and then to Lystra, where a disciple named Timothy lived. A disciple. That word, mathetes in Greek means follower, student of. So Timothy is a student of, a follower of, none other than Jesus. He's a disciple, a follower of Jesus. Well, how did he come to be a follower of Jesus? Well, it was mom and grandma. They had something to do with it. Because watch this. Whose mother, Timothy's mother, was Jewish and a believer. Now stop right there. She's Jewish, but somebody told her about Jesus. Could have been Paul back in Acts chapter 14. Paul was there in Lystra on his first missionary journey. And maybe while he was preaching and teaching, maybe Eunice, maybe Lois heard this, and as Jews, they came then to believe that Jesus was indeed, capital M, their Messiah. So she's Jewish, but she's also a follower of Jesus. She is a Messianic Jew, a Messianic Jew, all right? 
But then notice this, verse 1, but whose father, Timothy's biological dad, was a Greek. Some of you might be using a version that says he was a pagan. All this means was that he was not a follower of Jesus. He was not a disciple of Christ. In, in other words, Eunice and his dad, Timothy's dad, his mom and dad, had a marriage that we would call unequally yoked. That's correct. We got a believer married to an unbeliever. But somebody stepped up to the plate to make sure that young Timothy, baby Timothy, would hear the word of God. It wasn't his dad. It was his mom and his grandma. And being so Jewish, I wonder if, for example, let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 6. That mom and grandma, verse 4, chapter 6, Deuteronomy. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. That's what mom and grandma did. They impressed them on baby Timothy. Talk about them when you sit uh, at home. At the dinner table, they talked about the word of God. Uh, when you walk along the road, when they were walking out to get the mail, they were talking about the Word of God. When you lie down, when you tuck Timothy in, make sure you talk about the Word of God. When you get up, first thing, when you talk about uh, life, the, the new day, hey, good morning, hey, you know what it says in the Word of God? Talk about it when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands. Bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I believe with all of my heart that mom and grandma made sure that young Timothy's life was saturated with the Word of God. They reached to him, hoping that he would get saved. And then they taught him. Didn't teach him how to play soccer, as being most important in his life. They taught him what really mattered. And that was the Scriptures that would make him wise to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul, in Ephesians chapter 6, in Ephesians chapter 6, he says this, Fathers, do not exasperate your children. He's not talking to moms. He's not talking to grandmas. He's talking to dads. Fathers, do not exasperate, a word that means do not provoke to anger your kids. No, instead, do this. Instead, bring them up in the training and the instruction of the Lord. And what do you think the textbook is? Right here. This is the textbook. And we have to remember that even though Timothy's biological dad was not a believer, somebody in the family stepped up to the plate to make sure that this got done. We can't expect his dad biologically to take his son Timothy someplace where he has not yet been. So, gentlemen, dads, grandpas in the room, we don't get a get out of teaching, training our children, grandchildren free card just because Timothy's mom and grandma did it. No, we got to step up to the plate and do this. Now, I want to show you an example of what that looks like, okay? We're going to use Memorex. Uh, oh, I don't know, maybe a month to, I was upstairs working at my desk, and our pastor walked in. And he came in with uh, the three kids. So Hudson, age five, listen to these ages, age five, Addie, age three, and Luke, age two, five, three, two. And they come in and, you know, we're just visiting, love to see the kids. And, and out of the blue, Dan says, hey, kids, you want to say some scripture for Pastor Gary? And they go, oh, yeah. Well, I don't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so Dan, the man, he has them recite. Are you ready for this? Ephesians chapter 2, the entire chapter, age 5, age 3. I can get a couple of verses out of that chapter, but here they are, and I want you to see Dan with Addie and Hudson doing just a few of those verses from Ephesians chapter 2. Here we go. Okay, these guys have memorized all of Ephesians 2, and I'm going to have them do a few of the verses. I'll get them started. But because of His great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ. 
Even when you were dead in our transgressions, it's by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace and express his kindness to us. In Christ Jesus, for it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not of itself, the gift of God, not by works, so that no one may boast. For we are God's workmanship, in Christ Jesus, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Nice job, kids. Yay! Incredible. And that's just part of the chapter. But now, little Lukey, he, he was doing more than just playing with his toes. He was listening in. Because not to be outdone by big brother and big sister, little Luke, who is two, recited a passage of the Bible. I'm not going to tell you which one it is because I'm going to ask you when he's done which one it was. All right? Here we go. Little Luke, two years of age. Christ. Golden my ship, shall not work. I may fail you as the gun kayak wide is all my talk. Read me and pass up. Why is his name said? I will not walk through the valley, a shadow of death. I fear no evil. Your I will be. Your rod and your shah, they cut from you. You they prepare a table for me, presents of my enemies. You anoint on my hair with oil, cut over both. Surely, both will follow me, me all the days of my work. And I dwell in the house of the Lord forever. <laughs> I love that. And what passage of scripture was that? Psalm 23, the shepherd's psalm. Incredible. He's two years of age. Think with me for a moment. Uh, this, this last week I was on a number of flights for E2 and Fortunately, I got to sit in the exit row, and you've been in an exit row. The flight attendant comes up and says, hey, do you know you're in an exit row? Oh, yeah, uh, paid extra, okay. And the flight attendant then says, uh, are you willing to open this hatch uh, in the event of an emergency? And we have to say what? Yes, out loud. And the flight attendant goes along every, yes, 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 yes. It reminded me, I was on my way home from a mission trip overseas a few years back, and I was in the exit row. And the flight attendant was a little uh, edgy. She came up and she said, you know, you're all in an exit row. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, sure. Are you willing to open the exit in the event of an unlikely emergency? Oh yeah, we yeah, willing, yes, yes, yes. And then she looks at me and she goes, have you read the instructions? And I went, no. And she said, read them. And uh, not quite that harsh, but she said, read them. They're right here. And I, all right, I will. I had to get them out, start reading the how to open the hatch in the event of an unlikely emergency. And when that happened, I got to thinking, Dan and Karen are teaching their children the instructions of how to leave planet Earth someday safely into the arms of Jesus. We have the instructions. The question is, are we reading them so that we can reach and teach? Now, here's the second how. It's right here in the text. We got to think, care and share. We will not reach our children for salvation. We will not teach them the, the holy scriptures that are able to make them wise in salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. We won't do that unless we authentically care about their eternity. We will not share 
a spiritual life with them if we don't care about where they're going to spend eternity. We're more concerned about their graduation from college. We're more concerned about their 4.0 uh, grade point average on the dean's list. We're more concerned about their address when they buy their first house that they're going to be in the right neighborhood. We're more concerned about things that are temporal than things that are eternal. We got to care about their eternity first and foremost. Now watch what happens here in Paul's relationship. Chapter one of First Timothy, his first letter, he says in chapter one, verse two, to Timothy, my true what? Son in the faith. Father, son. Spiritual father, spiritual son. Notice also in verse 18, Timothy, my son. He does it again in Second Timothy chapter one. Notice in the salutation, he says, Verse 2, to Timothy, my dear son. Chapter 2, verse 1, then, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Not only in these two letters, but in, for example, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Paul says in verse 17, I hope to send you Timothy, my son in the faith, my son in the faith, whom I love. He did it again. In Philippians chapter 2, he calls Timothy his son who is working with him in the gospel of Jesus as a father works with his son. How how do you think that made Timothy feel? Overwhelmed. Though his biological dad had no interest in the spirituality of his life, he had somebody take him under wing to speak powerfully the words of Jesus in him, and he would have been overwhelmed with that. Overwhelmed. Plus, he's got mom and grandma. Here, here's the point. The older teach the younger. The older reach the younger. And they will only do that if they care about where they spend eternity and they will share hours upon hours, resources upon resources in their children and grandchildren's future. Think of it this way. We have six living generations now in America. The builders, remember Tom Brokaw's book, uh, The Greatest generation. It was about people who are now in their late 80s, their 90s, and even past the century mark. They're over 100 years of age. Many of them fought World War II. The builders. Who's the next uh, younger generation? Anybody? The boomers. That's right. There are a few boomers in the room, right? A lot of them at nine o'clock, but there are some boomers in this room. And that would be us, my age. We are boomers. Now, who's next younger. Uh, Generation X, that's right. I see a lot of Gen X in the room. And it is known that your generation, Gen X, the least is ever said about your generation. I am so sorry. We will get you medicated before the day is over, all right? (laughs) Now, who is the next youngest generation? They are called the millennials. I see all kinds of millennials in the room right now. Now, listen up. Boomers, we used to be the largest demographic in America. We are no longer the largest demographic. We have been edged out, pushed to the side by millennials. Your generation is the largest generation in America today. Now, who's younger, uh, next younger? Gen Z, that's right. Now, and here's a little factoid. The oldest Gen Z turns 24 in 2024. So from age 24 to age 40, you're millennials, all right? Now, the youngest, newest generation has been named about six months ago. Anybody know its name? Generation Alpha. That's exactly correct, Generation Alpha. So we have these six living generations. I am so thankful to Jesus that all six of them are present here at the creek. We are a multi-generational church, but listen up. It's different to be an intergenerational church where we integrate those who are older with those who are younger makes all the difference in the world. Now, I'm speaking to boomers in the room. Boomers, listen to your fellow boomer. We are living in what is called the silver tsunami. 2024, we entered into the silver tsunami. Think white hair, silver hair, okay? And it's a tidal wave. Why? Because this year, 11,000 boomers will turn 65 years of age. 11,000 every day, and it will continue through the year. There will be 4 million people turn 65 this year, and it will happen next year in 2025. It will happen the year after that in 26, and the year after that in 27. And by 2030, the last of us will turn 65 years old. We're a tidal wave. 
And you might be thinking, well, why is that important? Because America has a perverted view of retirement. I am so ashamed of how we do retirement. It has even become a, uh, an American dream for some. I'm going to work as hard as I can to earn as much as I can, as quickly as I can, so that I can quit work as early as I can and go play golf, collect seashells. And on the day of judgment, when I pass, when I pass from this life into, to be home with the Lord, hey, Jesus, look at my seashell collection. Aren't they awesome? You and I have fewer days ahead of us than we do behind us. Psalm 90, verse 12. Would you write it down? Would you pray it, please, my fellow boomers? Psalm 90, verse 12, it says, and this is the oldest psalm because Moses wrote it. And he says in the 12th verse, Lord, teach us to number our days aright uh, and give us a heart of wisdom. You and I need to pray, God, help me make this day incredible for your glory and honor. And every day that you and I have to live, We have this breath of life. It's a gift of God, and we should want to live this day for the glory of God. And how do we do that? When Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2 becomes reality in our lives. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I urge you in view of God's mercy, his mercy, he gave us another day of life, to offer your bodies as a what? Living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual act of worship. You and I worship 24-7, 365. How do we do that? By when we wake up every day with fewer days ahead of us than we have behind us, we say, here I am, God, a living sacrifice for you. What do you want me to do for your glory on this day before the sun sets? That's a living sacrifice. That will never happen in the boomer generation unless you and I change the way we think. That's the next verse, verse 2. Do not be conformed any longer to the perverted American culture, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Think differently about retirement than the rest of America. We will never change the way we live until we change the way we think about this. And until the day that I die, I want to serve Jesus with every breath that I have. Paul, the apostle, is probably about 65 while he's on death row. And I'm here to tell you, he was not uh, checking out. He was busy giving his life as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, until he would have his head severed from his body. I want to go out like that. Well, I'm not being crucified or executed, but um, okay. So why? Why has Scripture got to be a part of our life? Because that's how we learn about salvation, not from a sunset or a sunrise. Uh, how? How are we going to teach our children, grandchildren, those younger coming behind us? We're going to reach them and teach them, and that will only happen if we really care and share with them about that which is most important in life. Now, the what ring. Very quickly, the what ring. Two things that are essential. I will never live that way. I will never model that for my wife, my children, my grandchildren. That will never be reality unless these two things are true in my life and in yours. Number one, there has to be a hunger for Scripture. Where do we see that in this last will and testament of Paul? Easy. Chapter 4, notice in verse 9, do your best to come to me quickly. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. Titus has gone to Dalmatian. Only Luke is with me. Do your best to come come quickly, son. He wanted to see him before he died. And then notice in verse 13, he says, And when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas. Stop right there. Why would he want a cloak? Because in the Roman prison system, they were not giving you uh, blankets and sheets and a pillow. And it's winter. Look, Look over in verse 21. Do your best to get here before winter. It's getting cold. Please bring my cloak. And I wonder, as young Timothy is reading this, And he sees the handwriting of his beloved spiritual father. I just wonder if his tears were wetting the manuscript, the scroll. And I wonder if he picked up that that cloak and he could smell the brine on it from when Paul was shipwrecked in the Mediterranean. I wonder if he could see the bloodstain still on it from when he was stoned and left for dead. No dry cleaning, you know. This is an incredible moment. And then what does he say? And when you come, bring my scrolls. 
especially the parchments. He wanted the word of God, the parchments. He's got only X number of days left until he's going to be dead. And what does he want? The word of God. He had a hunger for the bread of life. We become what we eat. We become what we eat. And Paul became this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 9, he says, he writes, I am the least of the apostles. When he compared himself to the other 12 guys, I'm at the bottom rung of the ladder. Then he writes about five years later, Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 8, he says, I am the least of all God's people. He went from comparing himself to 12 guys and says, I'm the least. And now he's comparing himself to hundreds of thousands of followers of Jesus, all God's people. And he says, I'm at the bottom rung of the ladder. And then about five years later, he writes 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. And he says, here is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners of whom I am the worst. Paul's life changed. The more he ingested the word of God, the more he became like Jesus, we become what we eat. You and I will never bring the word of God into the lives of our children and grandchildren until you and I ingest the word of God. It's, it's essential. You know, um, uh, every year, hundreds of thousands of people have heart bypass surgery and the cardiologist, the cardiac surgeon, will say, okay, I can do this procedure, but you got to cooperate. And after people get out of that surgery and they recuperate, then the surgeon says, all right, you've got to change your diet, you've got to stop drinking, you've got to quit smoking, and the vast majority of people do not change their ways. In essence, they're saying, we would rather die than change. When this word, this living word of God comes into our life, it's got to change us. I want to give you another example. I still have a church key. They didn't take it away from me five years ago, all right? So I've got this church key, and I can get into a whole lot of doors. I used this key, and I went into our pastor's office. He's sitting over here with Karen. And I just want Dan to know... I've got his memorizing sheets off from his desk. He keeps them right here on the left corner. And uh, our pastor memorizes massive, massive passages of Scripture. As a matter of fact, our pastor has memorized entire books of the Bible. It's incredible. Dan is hungry for the Word of God. And it changes his life. He becomes what he eats. And I'm so grateful that he is my pastor. Uh, my only recommendation is that he would laminate them like I do mine. That's all. So. They wouldn't be as wrinkled then. So, and I will slip them onto his desk after service. So we got to have this hunger for the word. And we got to have, ready, a high view of scripture. Just simply said, we're close to wrapping up. A high view of Scripture, 2 Timothy chapter 3. It's one of the famous 16, three 16s in the Word of God. John 3.16, Colossians 3.16, and so on. So 2 Timothy 3.16, what does Paul say to Timothy? All Scripture. All is a pretty powerful word. It's a superlative in grammar. All Scripture. And that word Scripture in Greek, graphe, it means all written Scripture. All written Scripture is God-breathed. That means it's from God. God is the source of this, what you and I hold in our hands, all right? And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. That's a high view. And what we mean by high view, when, it, when God is the source of all Scripture and we are convinced of that, that means it's inspired, it's inspired, every written word. And, and because it's from God, inspired, that makes it inerrant. It's without error. And that also makes it infallible because it's incapable of error. The three eyes are so important. And this is what we want to pass on to our children and our grandchildren. I want to pass this on to all of you millennials and Gen uh, Z. 
Please hold to the unchanging truth of God's word. Be convicted. Be convinced. It's inspired. It is inerrant. It is uh, infallible. And Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. That's what I want you, the younger ones, to absolutely embrace. And your life will be forever changed because of that. So, GPS. Grace prayer, and scripture. And I'm going to ask you to make an action. A good sermon calls us to action. Do not be a mere hearer of the word and so deceive yourselves, but do what it says. Being an elder at the creek, what a privilege for me. And I just learned a few weeks ago that God is blessing us so much in Cadastral Park with all of these wonderful children uh, if I'm on the road for E2, I love coming back and just seeing all of these young people here. Cadestrial Park is burgeoning. But let me, that's the good news, but there's some bad news. All too often, we are having to turn parents and their children away. And they go out the door, they get in their car, and they drive off. Breaks my heart. And you want to know why that is? Because we don't have enough people working with the children. It's not just about square footage. No, it's about the number of people who are serving. When we, when we don't have enough volunteers in the room to care for 30, 35 kids, we can't allow any more in. And so the door gets closed and we just say, we're so sorry. We're so sorry. Please feel free to take your child into service, please. But that's very, that's very hurtful. So, one way, especially boomers, one thing that you and I could do, we could say to the team that leads Cadestrial Park, hey, I'm in. We could walk right over there today and say, here's my cell phone number, here's my e-address, text me, call me. I want to help so that we don't have to say to another child, sorry, no room for you today. Let's reach them for the glory of Christ. So I have no greater joy than to hear that my children, my grandchildren, are walking in the truth. Everything is secondary to that in my life. That brings me unbridled fulfillment, and I pray it does you as well. Jesus, in this moment, please speak to us. We have ears with which to hear. Shout into our souls what it is that we could uh, say, think, do, feel that brings you honor and glory today. So we lay all this at your feet. Thank you for this brief three-week journey on which we have been. And I stand on the promise that your word goes forth. It will accomplish the purpose for which it is sent. It cannot return void. For the glory of Jesus, in whose name